Good morning. It is Sunday, August the 6th. I'm Ali Velshi. Donald Trump's legal team has until 5 p.m. tomorrow to respond to the government's request for a protective order before it agrees to turn over evidence in the election interference case. The case. The ruling came actions filed on Saturday afternoon in quick succession. Trump's team asked to push the deadline back by three days and to hold a hearing on the matter. It's a sign of how the former president's attorneys may try to slow things down, much like the president's past attorneys have done in various other legal matters. Special counsel's team, however, quickly argued against it, calling that motion unnecessary. Ultimately, the judge, Tanya Chutkan, the federal judge who's been appointed to oversee the election interference case, denied the Trump team's motion for a delay. Chutkan's order came less than 24 hours after the government initially filed its request for the protective order, which would limit what information Trump and his attorneys can make public about the case. In its initial filing, the special counsel's team included a screenshot of a post from the former president's Truth Social page that read, quote, if you go after me, I'm coming after you, end quote. Former president published that post just one day after he was warned during his arraignment not to influence a juror or try to intimidate witnesses or anyone else involved in the case in any way. With this third indictment, Donald Trump now stands accused of numerous crimes involving his conduct from before, during, and after his presidency. There's been a lot of legal activity surrounding the former president over the past few months, but the historic nature of this moment should not be lost on any of us. We're seeing the wheels of justice turning, as they should, to address the attempted coup that many of us watched unfold in real time back on January 6th. The former president and his co-conspirators took many steps to get us to that point. They had to deceive and convince many people from many different walks of life to go along with their plan. The fake electors they had had to convince to sign fake documents. The members of Congress they had to persuade to stand up and object to the certification of certain states' votes. The supporters they called to gather in Washington, D.C. on January 6th, a previously unremarkable day that passed without fanfare after every election, who ultimately stormed the Capitol and ransacked the halls of Congress and succeeded in delaying the certification of Joe Biden's victory. Trump and his co-conspirators, unindicted co-conspirators at this point, failed two and a half years ago, but they came very close to toppling our system of government. If they had gotten just one more person, in particular this man, the vice president, Mike Pence, to go along with their scheme, things in America today could be very different. But Mike Pence didn't follow, Mike, uh, uh, follow Donald Trump's orders, thanks in part to a series of tweets that the retired former federal judge J. Michael Ludig posted on the morning of January 5th, 2021, quote, the only responsibility and power of the vice president under the Constitution is to faithfully count the electoral college votes as they have been cast. The Constitution does not empower the vice president to alter in any way the votes that have been cast, either by rejecting certain of them or otherwise, end quote. Those tweets were cited in the letter that Pence released on the morning of January 6th as he made his way to the Capitol to faithfully count the Electoral College votes as they were cast by the American people, despite Donald Trump's demands. Because as Judge Ludig concluded in that consequential post on Twitter on January 5th, quote, neither the vice president nor neither the president nor the vice president has any higher loyalty than to the Constitution, end quote. That former federal judge, Michael Ludig, joins me now. A momentous week for you, sir. Uh, I I know that you were not looking at all to be part of history on January 5th and January 6th of 2020, but you were. You're not named in the document, but but your fingerprints are kind of all over it because Mike Pence had the courage to continue to say what he had to say despite the pressure that Donald Trump and his attorneys were putting on him because you had told his attorney this is a non-starter. Thank you, Allie, for having me on uh, this morning. Uh, This is a tragic day for America. Uh, The world will will now bear witness to history as the first American president goes on trial for grave offenses against the United States. Uh, The day is all the more tragic uh, uh, because the the former president chose to inflict this this day and this moment uh, on the nation uh, and on, on the world, uh, on any given day, 
since January 6, 2021, the president, former president, could have avoided and prevented uh, this indictment and prosecution and trial. Uh, we now know the former president did not want to uh, avoid prosecution for these offenses. Uh, he wanted Jack Smith to indict him, prosecute him, and try him for these grave offenses uh, to prove to the world that he did win the 2020 presidential election. Uh, that makes this a very tragic day in American history, and it's a very tragic day uh, in, in world history, frankly, Allie. Judge, I want to. You're very familiar with things like these indictments, and I want to read. Uh, the other day, I read the, the whole thing as part of a podcast, and anybody who's watching this can just use that QR code in the corner to hear it. Uh, but you're very familiar with this type of thing, and I think it's really, really important to note that uh, within the first couple of pages of the indictment, Jack Smith and his team state very clearly that Donald Trump, under the First Amendment, had every right to doubt the outcome of the election, to challenge the outcome of election, to call for recounts, to call for audits, and to take the matter to court in order to litigate uh, what he thought, what, what he may have thought was an unfair outcome to the election. He did all of those things. There were audits, there were recounts, there were court cases, and they all came back with the same conclusion that there was no outcome determinant of fraud in the 2020 election. His supporters are claiming that that's just First Amendment stuff. He had the right to say all that stuff. What's the distinction here? What's the part that he had the right to do? And when did it turn into stuff that it is alleged that he did not have the right to do? This is critically important, Ali. Uh, Jack Smith anticipated that the former president's primary defense would be under the First Amendment to the United States Constitution. He crafted the indictment itself and the specific charges and counts in that indictment so as to walk around the First Amendment defense that he knew the former president would assert. So as a consequence, the former president does not have a First Amendment defense to any of these charges that have now been brought uh, against him by the grand jury. I want to talk to you about uh, a true social post. I don't tend to like to do this thing. I'm not on true social. I suspect you're not either. Uh, but in a post yesterday, Donald Trump responded to the new details about Mike Pence, uh, things that are included in the indictment. Donald Trump wrote that Pence has, quote, gone to the dark side. I never told Pence to put me above the Constitution or that Mike was too honest. He's delusional, and now he wants to show he's a tough guy, quote says, uh, Trump says. Trump was uh, reminded again during his arraignment not to influence jurors, not to intimidate witnesses. Uh, talk to me about all of this, that Donald Trump is taking material from the indictment and challenging it in public. Again, I, I suppose there are First Amendment rights to do that. What's the line between what you can do and what you can't do as it relates to people who are named in the indictment or people who are prosecuting this case? Unfortunately, Ali, uh, that Truth Social post comes as no surprise to, to anyone. Uh, in fact, we all expected that kind of thing, and we should expect it every day from now until uh, the end of, of this trial. Uh, the former president in this particular post uh, was referencing the indictment itself, and he does have the right to do that. What has been raised, you know, on, on day one by, by the government is that when the government provides the information and materials uh, to the former president and his defense team that the government is required to provide uh, uh, to, to the uh, defendant, uh, then uh, some of that is likely to include grand jury information that is protected from disclosure under uh, federal rule 6E. Uh, and it would be, uh, uh, it's a criminal offense to knowingly and intentionally disclose grand jury information uh, publicly. So what, what happened on, on day one, as it were, over the weekend, is that uh, when the, the um, special counsel saw this post, 
uh, he sought a protective order from the court. And that protective order was was designed and, and written so as to prevent the former president and his defense team from releasing uh, information that is going to be provided to them, uh, uh, which would be uh, the disclosure of which would be prohibited under law. So as to the post uh, over the weekend, the president had a First Amendment right, if you want to call it that, uh, to write that particular post. And he would always have that right, right. provided he never discloses protected information. Uh, you and I met while you were in the process of crusading for stronger uh, laws, including the Electoral College Act, uh, sort of a fixing of it to ensure that some of the stuff that happened on January 6th won't happen again. And there have been updates and changes to the Electoral College Act. In your opinion, however, given what you know, given your role in the matter, given what you've read in the indictment, are we in the future protected from a scheme and an effort like we have now seen was underway to overcome the 2020 election? Are we protected against that in the future? Can that, is there enough that has changed where that can't happen again? That's exactly the, 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 the right question, Allie, to ask. Um, and, and the answer, I, I think, is this. Uh, the Congress of the United States in the 11th hour uh, did uh, pass the Electoral Count Reform Act, which amended and, and clarified and strengthened the the, uh, the act that, that had preceded it. In addition, as, as you know uh, well, the, the, the plan to overturn the, the 2020 presidential election uh, depended upon uh, something called the independent state legislature uh, theory of constitutional interpretation. And that issue was joined in the case Moore versus Harper that was decided by the Supreme Court at the end of this last term. And the court uh, roundly rejected that, that theory. So together with the, the changes and, and reforms to the Electoral Count Act, uh, and the rejection of, of the independent state legislature theory by, by the Supreme Court, um, I, I do not believe that, that we will experience uh, another January 6th uh, uh, in, in history. That does not mean that, that uh, America is uh, out of the woods as to democracy. Uh, as long as the, the, the former president and his allies and supporters are defending what happened on January 6th and contending that that was necessary uh, in order to uh, further and advance and protect our democracy and our Constitution, then American democracy remains in peril. Judge, uh, you're certainly one of my favorite conservatives that I ever have on the show, but we, you know we have a lot of them on. And yesterday I had Tom Nichols, a conservative writer, on who said that, you know, while the, the president is going to be the defendant possibly in three cases, which may or may not be settled before the 2024 election, these cases are critically important. However, the election may be more important. In fact, if people have to separate their conservative and liberal politics and their right and left politics from their decisions about whether they wish to cast a ballot to preserve democracy or not in the next election. Do you share that view? Yes, the, 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 the what will now be the multiple uh, trials, state and federal, uh, of the former president between now and, and, and the election in 2024 will be a, a, a spectacle uh, unlike uh, America or the world ha has ever seen. But that, you know, that, that, those trials stand alone from the election itself. Now, in the election itself, you know, the former president while he is on trial for these grave offenses, both state and federal, he will be the presumptive nominee of the Republican Party. And so he will be campaigning, uh, as we would expect, uh, on, on the, a platform, if you want to call it that, that the 2020 election was stolen from him uh, and that uh, he won that election fair and square, 
when in fact he actually lost that election fair and square. So for two and a half years, these uh, continuing and persistent claims by the former president and his uh, his allies and supporters have laid waste to uh, uh, Americans' confidence in their elections, uh, in in uh, their democracy, and in, in their institutions of, of law and democracy. Uh, the trial and the trials, they will not end that uh, corrosion of American democracy. Neither will the election. Uh, but were the former president to win this election, uh, we would have little hope of, of uh, saving American democracy in, in the near, near future. Judge, we always appreciate the time that you give to provide your analysis. But as I read this this week, uh, as I said, you're not named in it. But we know from your testimony and from January 6th what your role was in it. And we are a grateful nation for what you have done. Judge Michael Ludig is the former federal judge of the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Allie.